And it's also interesting because, conversely, we see no real evidence for ice at the surface of Ceres. Uh, Ceres is just way too warm to keep ice at the surface, but there's all this evidence from uh, observations by Hubble and, and theoretical uh, work that there's a lot of ice in Ceres. So that creates this interesting paradox. We think there's a lot of ice there. We don't see any at the surface. Um, how that's going to translate into into what we find when we show up there is uh, still very much an open question. Yeah, that's a, that's an idea that's, that was really bizarre for me last time we talked about this because you think of icy bodies being in the outer solar system, moons around the, the giant planet, the gi gas giants, or uh, out in the Kuiper belt. You don't expect to find something like that not only in the asteroid belt, but the largest member of the asteroid belt. I mean, we even just know from from density arguments um, that the density of Ceres is 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 low. It's it's uh, it it has a density that suggests it's about one third ice by mass. And um, certainly, fifteen or twenty years ago, and when, when you know we started grad school, or some of us started grad school, <laughs> um, the the idea was that there wasn't really much ice interior to Jupiter. Um, okay. And there's been a lot of work from from dynamics and uh, and a lot of, at least some evidence, that a lot of material has, has really moved around in the solar system. And at least one, one you know, serious senior member of, of the community suggested Ceres formed out past Neptune and got transported all the way in. I think that... that um, the evidence is against that. He suggested it a few years ago, and I think evidence has, has mounted since then that it's that it's not the case. But uh, it it really has appeared to be a fish out of water. Katie, you must have some perspective on that because part of the reason that we thought that way back when, when Andy was was mentioning at the beginning of of his grad school days, was because of uh, was because of meteorite studies, right? Was that we were kind of forcing forcing things into a rather small box, if it, as it were. So I was wondering if you would share some of that perspective. Yeah, um, sort of some of the stuff I'm working on is really thinking about, you know, what Annie said, right? Okay, we think that nothing much has happened to these guys. They're from smaller bodies and things haven't moved around that much. Um, and really thinking about how true that is. Uh, I think it was suggested a couple of decades ago that there could be fluid flow on these bodies and now people think that they might convect and, uh, you know, really what do the meteorites say and how can we sort of use meteorites to constrain some of these models. Um, so this picture is uh, a picture from a billion dollar instrument called a synchrotron. So there's one of those in Australia and um, it also happens to have the one detector in the world that can uh, map elements across a uh, whole meteorite section. So this is a section of a meteorite and it can basically scan along this guy in a couple of hours and get trace elements and all sorts of other interesting chemical facts. Uh, but this is a map that's created by combining um, the distribution of several elements. So green is iron and red is nickel and blue is chromium. And so what you notice right away in Bigrano, uh, which is sort of like Allende, the meteorite I was, the carbonaceous chondrite, thank you Andy, that I was talking about earlier. We think Bigorano is kind of stable, one of the not too altered meteorites. Uh, but even here you can tell, well, number one, that the nickel, which is the red, is obviously moving around. Um, and it's moving around in the same direction. So the sort of a blob at the upper right-hand corner is traveling you know, roughly parallel to the two blobs that met just below it. Um, so, uh, you wouldn't be able to, I mean, those differences in the elements are um, sort of hundreds of parts per million, so it's really hard to kind of detect those differences any other way. And you can tell also right away that there's unaltered material here, so things that are still very heterogeneous and kind of broken up, but also these you know, veins of altered material that's been fairly homogenized. And, um, you know, this is something that we obviously didn't really expect to see when we decided to, you know, see what meteorites look like with this new technique. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, which is one of the meteorites that um, we think altered at lower temperature, so the serpentinite uh, type ones. Um, 
And so when Andy was talking about uh, carbonate and brucite and meteorites that have hydroxyl groups or water attached to them, uh, Murchison is the exact sort of meteorite you'd want to be thinking about because this is the meteorite that has lots of carbonate in it. Um, it has minerals similar to brucite, although not exactly, and it definitely has a lot of OH groups. You know, one of the things we're really starting to think about in meteorites lately is, uh, you know, what sort of object did they come from, and, uh, you know, could they be from something like Ceres that's big? What do we really know about the material that makes up Ceres? Uh, are they from uh, something that's, you know, much smaller, like we thought, you know, a couple decades ago? much like iron meteorites, right, that are cores of internal objects that completely split up and were big at one time, is that the same thing with carbonaceous chondrites? Are they from big objects too? Or, you know, does the fact that the chemistry is so uniform mean that they had to be from smaller stuff? And, you know, you can just kind of go to bigger and bigger questions from there. Uh, I just wanted to, to say that these images were really awesome because it's this tiny, tiny... Uh, tiny close-up look at some of the oldest things in the solar system, right? These are, these are the yeah. time capsules of the first things um, that formed in the solar system, and this is what we think that uh, Ceres may hold in store. Is that correct? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so Very my cool. favorite analogy for carbonaceous chondrites is that they're the vacuum cleaner dust bag. <laughs> so if you lived in your apartment and, you know, didn't vacuum for a long time and just kind of hung out there for a couple million years and then somebody came and vacuumed up and then you know a couple million know years later like. oh. it became a rock and then you could dissect you know what you ate at all the different points in time <laughs> so I kind of view carbonaceous chondrites as very similar to that it's kind of like the vacuum cleaner bag from the whole solar system